Today on Focal Point, from Pastor Mike Fabares. Often for us, it's not a question between good and bad. A lot of times the questions are between better and best. We've got lots of decisions to make. Whether it's a relationship decision, whether it's a decision about my investment in a ministry or my investment in my kids' uh, extracurricular activities. I mean, we hit all these crossroads constantly in our lives and we need to say, wait a minute, I wanna make sure that the adjustments that I make and the paths that I walk down are the paths that God would have me walk down. Bible, God directs His people in remarkable ways, through burning bushes, pillars of smoke, even through talking animals. But those were the exceptions, not the rule. When it comes to the everyday choices we face, we don't often get a straightforward sign from heaven. Instead, God's got a different way of speaking. Today on Focal Point, Pastor Mike Fabares gives clear direction from Scripture about making wise decisions and following God's will for our lives. He titled this series, Working the Plan. We are on our way to a great place, but between now and then, whether it's the next five years, 15 years, or 35 years, God has an interest in the daily affairs of our lives. In great passages like Matthew 10, it says that God uh, is so concerned about his creation in general that even those little sparrows, that, those annoying sparrows that hop around hunting for your fries at McDonald's, uh, those sparrows are cared for by God. God cares about them today. And he, he really is, is in tune to his creation. And then he says, well, how much more valuable are you to God than those little birds? Hugely. Then he goes on to say something fantastic. He says, you know, God is so concerned about you that he has a concern for every hair on the top of your head. Every hair, every follicle, he's, he's got it all cataloged. He, he cares about the details of our lives. And that's an amazing truth. And it ought to be one that just gets us to think, wow, that is, uh, that's amazing. God cares about us. And in that Matthew 10 passage, he says lots of great things. But what a lot of people miss, I think, in studying that text is that he constantly repeats this little Greek word, pater, which means father, your father, your father, your father. And I think us dads can recognize that, uh, I mean, that ought to clinch it for us, that God is a, a God who, who has a, a loving interest in our lives, just like we can't help but have a loving interest in the lives of our children. I mean, who can't care about the choices that our, that our daughter makes in life? Or, or who doesn't really uh, sit back with real concern and interest in, in the choices of, of one's son and, and what kind of path that they will take? I mean, that, that's, um, that's a big deal. And we recognize God cares about our lives. First Corinthians 16, we looked at the fact that uh, the Apostle Paul was concerned that he find the path that God would have for him, and he, he was very intentional about it. And we talked about that. It's important for us to be a bit more intentional as Christians than we default to being, often very passive and very reactionary. We should be planners. We should think. We should say, what, what good would God have me do in all these different arenas of my life? And I trust that was a challenge to you, particularly that section in the middle of the sermon where we said that God is a God who wants to uh, retain the right to change the plan when he sees fit. Remember that? And we said, okay, God has the right to do that. God is a God who, uh, who, who should be able to make divine adjustments to the plan. The problem, though, is as we studied that and just kind of briefly glanced off of that, is that we didn't have any tools in the passage to really figure out how we know if God is making adjustments to the plan. I mean, we were left without any, any tools. That was, certainly wasn't the intention of the passage. And say, so we need a little broader perspective here on how we're supposed to know, as we face the fork in the road, how God would have us make decisions between this option or that option. Because often for us, it's not a question between good and bad. A lot of times the questions are between you know, good and, and, and better and better and best. We've got lots of decisions to make. And, and, and the point is, the premise is God cares. And so we need to learn how to do this in a way, whether we're facing a, a choice about our career or moving geographically, whether it's a relationship decision, whether it's a decision about marriage, whether it's a decision about adoption or having kids, whether it's a, a decision about my investment in a ministry or my investment in my kids' uh, extracurricular activities. I and mean, we hit all these crossroads constantly in our lives. And we need to say, wait a minute, I want to make sure that the adjustments that I make and the paths that I walk down are the paths that God would have me walk down. 
And so this is a helpful and necessary topic for us because we are always exposed to these kinds of decisions and crossroads. And so I want to start by giving us a, 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 a matrix, a grid. And by the time we're done, we've got a series of five questions that we can ask ourselves whenever we face the crossroads in our Christian life where we're trying to discern as best we can what would be God's adjustment, what would be God's direction here. Uh, because we don't have the benefit of, of the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. Wouldn't that be nice? You ever think about that? I mean, if, I, you know, if God wants us to go to Nebraska, we watch the cloud and there it goes. You know, it's just west of Wyoming. And so we're going to Nebraska. I mean, it's irrefutable. It's, it, we find out that discovering God's direction for us is a bit more of, a, of an art than a science, it seems. But we're going to do our best to move it out of the, the mysterious realm and into some concrete, okay, here's how we go about it. So let's turn to Psalm 119 to get started to find the first question that we should ask when we're facing that decision about whatever it might be where we're concerned that this is the right path that God would have us take. And this is very foundational. It's very fundamental. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed that we have to discuss it, but given the culture of our day and, you know, the way you hear a lot of Christians talk, it's very important that we start at the basics. So Psalm 119, the longest chapter in all of the Bible, the topic is God's word. And so often through this chapter, in many places actually, throughout the Bible, the Christian life is discussed in terms of a path, a path that we walk down. And in this text, the psalmist is concerned that he take the right path and that he stay on the right path. And he puts it this way in verse number 29, Psalm 119, verse 29. The psalmist says, keep me from deceitful ways. Don't want to go down a deceitful path. Don't want to walk down a deceitful alley here. And the deceitfulness is is the a la Hebrews, you know, three deceitfulness of sin, the kind of option for us that flashes at us and says, this would be a good path. And and we we, we're kind of easily duped into thinking, well, that that is something we should do. And and in reality, there's there's, you know, a little subtle deception there. It's not going to take us down the road. God would have us down. And and the psalmist says, I just want to stay away from those, those enticing pathways, those enticing off ramps that God wouldn't have us walk down. He says, keep me from that. And then he's back to the theme of Psalm 119. And the second half of verse 29 says, be gracious to me through your law. For I have chosen, look at this in verse 30, the way of truth. I want to be on the right path. I'd like to to be on on the path that God would want, the path of truth. So he says, I've set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, O Yahweh. Do not let me be put to shame. Now, I love this phrase, underline it. In verse 32, it says, I run in the path of your commands. That's a great way to put it. I run in the pathway or the path of your commands. Now, just stop and catch that imagery for a minute. Here's the psalmist saying, I want to stay with, within the pathway or, or, the, or the roadway, if you will, of, of your commands, which gives us a sense of, of parameters, gives us a sense of boundaries. I mean, let's just take that imagery and create our first question. Number one on your worksheet, if you're taking notes today, here's the first question we got to ask. What are the biblical boundaries? What, what are the things that are inside the, the allowable commands of God? And what are the things that are outside the allowable commands of God? That this is prohibited in Scripture. Jim may be a single uh, young Christian guy and he wants to get married. Well, marrying Fred is outside the biblical commands. You recognize that. You don't seem to be as affirming as I'd anticipated. But <laughs> Jim should not marry Fred. Okay? I know the church is confused on this these days, but that's outside the allowable commands of God. The Bible's very clear on that. That's not an option for you, Jim. Okay? Now, Jim may say, well, okay, fine, can't marry Fred, but I'm going to marry uh, Susie, uh, who's, who's not a Christian. And I hope again we'd say, well, wait a minute, Scripture's clear, 2 Corinthians 6, you, you, sh- you should not be unequally yoked, that imagery of connecting contractually with a non-Christian. So here's the thing, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be inside the allowable commands of God for, for Jim, the Christian guy, to marry Susie, the non-Christian girl, so that's not an option for you, okay? Now that narrows it down to a few hundred thousand Christian women, I suppose, that are single and wanting to be married. I realize it doesn't, you know, focus in on on one person, but it helps me recognize options that are not allowable. And I guess that can be ridiculously obvious when we face some choices, even some desires that we may say, well, this is what I want to do. I may be tired of my wife and I want a new wife. I don't, I'm not, but let's just say by way of example, I am. If I said, I want to go out and get a new one, trade her in for a new one, you would hopefully say with a hopefully more enthusiasm than that for my wife's sake, you would say, no, don't do that. That's outside the biblical commands of God. Don't do that. Or if I say, well, I like my wife, but I'd like a couple more. So we're, you know, I, let's do that. Polygamy. You'd say, no, 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 wait a minute. That's not what the scripture says, right? First, first Timothy three, husband of one wife. That's what, that's the, that's the goal. Okay. So we know things that are outside. 
Now, all that's easy, right? You're going, pull the fine, fine. I understand. Simple. But usually where we as Christians fall and, 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 and fail in this particular question is not the act itself. Usually we as Christians fall, and here's a good passage to jot down, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, chapter 4, verse 5, is in the area of our motives, and that's very important. I may say, I want to do this, it's a biblically allowable thing for me to do, but it may be motivated by all the wrong reasons, and here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, one day we will be judged based on the motives of our heart. Now, does the motive make the action right? Can Jim marry Fred because he's got a good motive? No. <laughs> With more enthusiasm, no, that can't happen. No. See, and I know today we're confused on that. We think a good motive justifies the wrong action. It does not. But the right action is nullified by the wrong motive. And God says, you got the wrong motive. It's wrong. Don't do it. You may want to be a pastor. Fantastic. That's a great thing to do. But you may want to do it, and I may want to do it for all the wrong reasons. That would make it wrong. So when I ask the question, what are the biblical boundaries, I want to apply that not only to the action, I'd like to apply that also to the motive. And if you don't apply it on that level, man, we're missing out. Because God says, one day I'm going to look at those motives of yours and see if you made that move to Nebraska for all the right reasons. I mean, maybe moving to Nebraska and being an architect is a great thing to do. Go for it. But maybe if we're doing it for all the wrong reasons, maybe I'm so materialistic, I just can't get enough square footage in California and I want more, 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 more. Maybe it'd be all the wrong reasons God would say. If the right thing to do is for the wrong reasons, sorry, that wasn't good. That's not the path I want you to walk down. Be careful. Be ruthless about your motives, not just your actions. But it's a good question to ask, and we've got to ask it. What are the biblical boundaries? Here's a good cross-reference to study. Joshua 1, verses 7 and eight. Remember these great words. Another imagery of the pathway. If you depart from God's rules to the right or the left, you're in trouble. But if you'd stay within the boundaries of God's rules, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, it says, then you're going to prosper and find success. There's where you want to be. Or if you still got Psalm 119 open, do you? Look at verse 35. It says, direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Does that sound good? I'd like to have a life where I think this is right. This is it. This is good. I know it's where I need to be. Well, then stay within the parameters, both in action and in motive. Turn my heart, notice the motive in verse 36, toward your statues and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. God, I want to stay within the boundaries. My heart, I want to be careful to police that. I want to do the right things for the right reasons, biblical boundaries. Okay? Well, that's great. In my life, I'm facing option A, option B, option C, option D. Option D is the only one that's outside the bounds that still leaves me with A, B, and C. What do I choose? Don't know which college to go to. Don't know if we should adopt a child. Don't know if we should become missionaries in the Philippines. We don't know, but they're out there. There are options for us. Okay? Second question. A good passage to help underscore this, I know it's review, is, is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Turn to this passage with me. It's one of six passages that I want you to look at today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. You might remember in last week's passage, Paul starts making plans, and he uses words like this as the impetus for his plan. He uses words like, I want, and I don't want, and I hope. He's using words about personal preference and his desires, okay? And I know that's a dangerous thing for some people, checking in with our desires, but we call them sanctified desires, if you will, the eagerness to do a good thing. We need to check in with that. Look how it's put in this passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verse number 11. In the middle of the verse, it says that Paul and his missionary team are constantly praying for these Thessalonians. Why? That our God may count you worthy of his calling. That's another way of saying that you would, you know, your calling is to be holy people, that you would be being holy people. That would be good. And that by his power, now underline this, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours. Did you check that out? Every good purpose of yours, another way to translate that one word, the purpose of yours, is the word intentions or good desires. Every good desire of yours and every act prompted by faith. Now, look at what he's asking for. I want God to fulfill that. When you have a good desire, I want God to fulfill that good desire. I may have a good desire that's biblically allowable to move to Nebraska and be an architect. That may be exactly what God wants me to do. And if that is a godly desire and a godly intention, the Apostle Paul says, I hope God would confirm that and do that in your life. Second question to ask, what do you want to do? Option D is off the board, but what do you want to do when you're looking at option A, B, and C? Don't be afraid of that question. Just know it's a dangerous question because sometimes our desires, according to Galatians 5, can be skewed. We can want the wrong thing. 
Just nod at me because we can all want the wrong thing, right? You've wanted the wrong thing before, or is that just me? You've wanted the wrong thing. But sometimes in your heart, God is working in your heart to want the right thing, to make you eager for the right thing, and to do that thing, to go to that college, to do that in the business venture, to get involved in that ministry. It's God that is, is empowering and make you eager, making you eager for that good thing. Don't ignore that. Check in with it regularly. What does God want me to do? Well, let me ask this question. What do I want to do? Because God is working within the arena of my desires. As a matter of fact, keep reading there in, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at verse 12. We pray this, here's the purpose clause, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. Well, that's an interesting merging of the mysterious plan of God and glorifying himself in my desires. We want God, Christ in particular, to be glorified in your life and you in him. We want that to happen. And maybe your desire to go to Nebraska and be an architect is exactly how God wants to glorify himself. Check in with that desire. Now, if it's one that stands against all the other five questions, then maybe we discount it. Maybe we think I'm a little confused. Maybe I'm a little skewed on my desire. But when it all starts to fit together, we say, wait a minute, this, this must be exactly the off ramp God wants me to take. Or he may want me to stay on this pathway because I'm sensing it's not only biblically allowable, it's also something I desire. And three more questions that we're going to look at here. By the way, I just want to let you know, this doesn't apply to non-Christians, right? This whole sermon really doesn't either, but this point in particular. What I'm assuming is the foundation of what the New Testament teaches and what the Old Testament anticipated, and that is passages like what Ezekiel 34, God is going to take out my heart of flesh and rebellion against God and put within me a new spirit, a new heart that's going to beat in sync with God's desires. If I'm not 2 Corinthians 5, 21, a new person in Christ, then you know what? This doesn't work. 517, sorry. Uh, it doesn't work. I, I've got to recognize that if I'm a Christian, now I've got to tap into what, what is that new heart of mine desiring to do? Check in with that regularly. Good cross-reference for homework here, Psalm 37, 3 and 4. If we would focus on, purpose on doing good, then we delight ourselves in God and he will give you the desires of your heart. You'll do that. How does that work? Mysteriously. My desires start to get in sync with God's purpose for my life. And here we are. Here comes this off-ramp. Wait a minute. Does God want me to take this off-ramp? Does God want me to, to do that, to walk down that path? Well, is it biblically allowable? Is God creating a desire in my heart to do it? Okay, that's getting helpful. It's becoming more clear. Fantastic. Number three. Are you ready for number three? <laughs> Warning. Okay. This is the scary one. Put a little uh, exclamation point, a little, I don't know, a little hazardous triangle. Put something on the worksheet that says warning, okay? This one is easily abused, okay? It's easily abused, and it's much debated. Then I'm going to try to clarify it. I recognize it's often abused, but it is part of the process. Are you ready? Number three. Here's the number three question, then we'll look at a couple of passages, try and make some sense of this. Number three. What do I think the Holy Spirit wants me to do? What do I think the Holy Spirit wants me to do? Danger. Why is that so dangerous? Because people blame a lot of things on the Holy Spirit that they shouldn't. And the Holy Spirit's going, I didn't say that. Right? I guarantee you that's what he's saying. Nine times out of ten, not nine, that's too much. Three times out of four? I don't know. Half the time, I'm hearing people say, well, I feel God wanted me to tell you this. And I'm quite sure after I hear it, God didn't want them to tell me that. Or you hear the stories about somebody coming up to somebody in a youth group, God told me to marry you or whatever. You know, be careful. You can abuse it. And then how do you argue with that, right? If someone tells you that, God told me to do. <sighs> You've got to recognize that though this is often abused and can be abused and is abused and is often misunderstood, it doesn't invalidate a proper role of the Holy Spirit influencing the path and direction of my life. I cannot discount that because there is a reality in Scripture that begins with Jesus telling his disciples when he was going to leave them, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Remember that? I'm not going to leave you as relational orphans. I won't be here. You won't have me to ask. I won't be able to direct you because I'm going back to sit at the right hand of the Father. But I'm telling you what, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And in John 14 through 16, he starts to explain the Holy Spirit's role in the Christian's life that would be from that point on. And I realized there were special aspects during that period for the apostolic age. But I recognize that the way he describes it for the whole progeny of the Christian life is in terms like he will be your comforter. He will be your guide. He will be your helper. He will be this parakletos. He will be a counselor to you. All the words 
that are given us in the passage where Jesus is explaining the Holy Spirit leads me to think that the resident person of the Godhead in my life, the Holy Spirit, has something to do with helping me live the Christian life. And even the most ardent uh, uh, opponent to this view is going to at least say, I hope, that, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is still a reality, right? When I'm walking down a, a, a pathway of temptation, the Holy Spirit has some effect on my spirit and he convicts me of sin. That he brings peace to my life in the midst of uncertainty and the Holy Spirit has an active effect upon my spirit. Or even as Romans 8 says that the Holy Spirit testifies to my spirit about some realities like I'm loved by God. Like God has the future in his hands. All those things in Romans chapter 8. There's a lot that the scripture says about the spirit's ongoing work and ministry to my spirit. And just like a dad is concerned about my son saying he wants to be this or that and having some input on those things that he's thinking about becoming as a, as a man in society, I'm telling you what, the spirit has an opinion. And so we need to get to the place where we can discern with wisdom as best we can, what is it that the Holy Spirit wants me to do here? Which is, in some sense, independent of my spirit. I recognize that. I am not the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit is said to live resident in my life. I have desires that I'm trusting or being influenced by His desires, but when I'm thinking about what do I want, I want to ask the question, what does God want here? What do I think God wants and that's where James chapter 1, verse 5 fits into this. If any of you lacks wisdom, remember that passage? Let him ask of God who will say, figure it out on your own, right? Is that how the passage goes? No. What does it say? He'll give you wisdom. And I don't just think it's going to direct you to a passage of Scripture. Scripture will never, ever be in conflict with the Spirit's guidance in one's life. No way around it. He's not going to contradict the book that he wrote. But we need to recognize that when I'm faced with option A, B, and C, and all of them are, are biblical options, D has been ruled out because it doesn't work in the biblical framework, either by my motive or by the act itself, I still need to think, you know what? I need to determine the option based on what I want and my sense and best understanding of what I think God wants. Now, that's not propositional, objective, irrefutable biblical truth. That special revelation that is different, it's in a different category. But I do need to recognize that the Spirit has an ongoing work in my life that will help me determine the wisdom of the path that I should take. He is a giver of wisdom. He's a spirit of comfort and peace in my life. And I need to recognize that. Following the Spirit's lead as we work the plan and live intentionally for God. You're listening to Focal Point with pastor, author, and teacher, Mike Fabares. Today's message is part of a much larger study in 1 Corinthians, and you can find previous messages when you visit focalpointradio.org. Pastor Mike's teaching is completely free to access thanks to support from listeners like you, coming together and doing what they can. We're so grateful. Every gift truly makes an eternal impact in the lives of those who listen, helping them explore the depths of Scripture. Now, if you're ready to be part of that mission, here's the number to call, 888-320-5885, or give online at focalpointradio.org. And when you give today to express our thanks, we'd like to send you a copy of the book we've been highlighting this month called How to Finish the Christian Life, Following Jesus in the Second Half. Authors George and Donald Sweeting, a father-son team, explore our purpose in the golden years and offer practical advice on serving God as we approach the finish line of life. They talk about everything from retirement to funeral preparations. And while these subjects may be uncomfortable for some, it's important that we think ahead and make a plan to finish well. We'd love to send you a copy of this practical guide. Again, it's titled, How to Finish the Christian Life, and it comes with our thanks for your support of this ministry. And when your gift is $75 or more, in addition to the book, we'll also include a USB drive containing Pastor Mike's complete study of 1 Corinthians, including popular series like People Who Make a Difference, Holiness, and our current series, Working the Plan. The USB is a convenient way to listen at your own pace or share these studies with a friend. To make your gift of support and request both these valuable resources, here's the number to call, 888-320-5885 or donate online at focalpointradio.org. Well, I'm your host, Dave Drewy, inviting you back again Wednesday for another message about living intentionally on Focal Point. Hi, Pastor Mike here. God's Word promises it'll never return void. 
So I wonder, how is God's Word moving in your heart right now? Drop us a line. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to be praying for you here. Just go to focalpointradio.org and then be sure to join us again tomorrow right here as we continue to explore the depths of Scripture. We'll see you then. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Focal Point Ministries.